So thank you all, and we are going to ask our three panelists to come sit at the uh, at the city council members' <laughs> dais, and we can all ask questions. So I get to ask the first two questions, and then I'll, I'll stop and let the audience. But I have a couple of things I just have to ask you guys. So first of all, um, Joe, any ideas yet about outcomes from the art project? Do you guys have any inklings? Outcome. Green light. Yeah. All right. I'm technologically challenged tonight. Um, well, I think the uh, I really appreciated Jeremy's last slide about the um, timing, or the second to last slide about how the timing of, of interventions is going to roll out, and I think that's really accurate. I think that what we're going to see come out, it's, it's most important out of the art project in, in the early going is is the um, sort of governance and financing strategies that are going to be essential in the in the early going to figure out how are we going to work together um, within communities. So San Rafael, for example, will have to decide who are its necessary partners to achieve success at the local level, at the at the county level, at the state and federal level, in order to um, achieve climate resilience and. So I think that rather than focusing on built solutions and, and, and you know next week we're going to get out there with shovels and, and uh, picks and put together this, this uh, structure to save ourselves, it's really more a question of how do we organize uh, the community around this issue and develop the kind of planning and the kind of institutions and partnerships that are necessary to be successful. Thank you, and I have one more question. Um, and this is assuming that we can do this and get our community and our region together to do, to do this, and this question is for Jeremy. How do we make sure we get to hire you to do our study? <laughs> um, well, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the adaptation strategies we talked about are basic modifications of things we're already doing in terms of wetland restoration and in terms of um, uh, flood risk management. So they're, they're not necessarily particularly new things that they think we're putting them together in different ways um, and I think that uh, we have a there is a lot of experience in the bay amongst lots of different groups and firms and so on about wetland restoration that's one huge advantage we have in San Francisco unlike some other estuaries and other bays who have only who haven't really had this uh, 30 years worth of program of, of restoration. So we're much more in touch, I think, with the, with the bay and the wetlands and how to deal with them. That's what I found at Hayward, that their planning group was set up 30 years ago primarily for the restoration and protection of the natural ecosystem. And um, I think they then realized that they restored everything they possibly could and they needed another rationale and decided the sea level rise was a good one. That would keep them going for a much longer. So, but... <laughs> I, I think that's that's one huge advantage that we have in the Bay. And when you say you know you know hire us, there 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 is lots of expertise in the in the in San Francisco Bay, and other places uh, are looking to us um, to provide some leadership and some demonstration. So what I would like to see here is um, st some demonstration projects of some of the ideas that are, are around, um, rather than just waving our arms and talking about it. And then I'm going to ask for the audience to ask questions. And Bill is going to hand the microphone out so that you can be mic'd and be heard on the recording, too. Yes. The question I have, has anyone done a study when we have a high tide in the influence of the moon in the gravitational pull of the earth, especially with the earthquake we had in Japan. It is my understanding, you know, the, the earth has moved a little bit. So my suggestion to you, it is for you to do a, a study when it is high tide and then identify the spot where the water encroach into, in, in where it should not then that will be the first priority to build sanitary wall there. And they shouldn't cost them much for this reason. I know for a fact, I live a 15 summit and the creek come down front of my house. When I built the house there in 1963, now, when it rained very hard, I have two waterfall in each side of the Anyway, my, my, let me get to the point. That could be done. I can show you how we did it. The second, we are also talking about environment. We do know 
The, the storm drain dump a lot of pollution to the bay and everywhere. Why can we build the basin everywhere where the storm drain discharge so it can be dredged and taken out and instead to dump it in the bay, take those dredge to filling in the land in places. Because you see what is happening right now in correct my throne, that's what I see, okay? I mentioned first the tide in the moon, because I know that is something we know for, for many years. So s use the information we already have. A second, we dredged in the stuff we dredge that is full of pollution from the car and also from the flower bed. Every time someone builds a new building, an office building, the city council of a different city makes mandatory they, they must have a flower and garden. In those gardens, in order to grow, they got to be fed, they got to be given fertilizer, and all that, where does it go? In the water table and down the bay, in the storm drain. So that's my second suggestion. And the third suggestion is this. We need to first, before you think about the, the sea rising, do the study on the high tide and, and identify the vulnerable spot. And I give it some time to some more people. They might have a better idea. Thank you very much. Um, well, I would just say that you know, I, I know that in the art project we found a couple of low spots, as you pointed out, where um, there may be a, a short low spot in a levee that's, that's maybe currently vulnerable to high tide, and if you raise that one spot, you protect a huge area. So we're, we're actually finding what you're talking about in, in the area that we're studying. And you're quite right to look at the tides. I mean, there is a project called the King Tides, which is the highest astronomical tides. They're the ones that the sun and the moon create. And they always occur on public holidays, on Thanksgiving, on New Year's. And, on, and because you had to go out and photograph them. But they're the highest tides that we see. And I, if I hadn't been cut short by, by the, our very efficient timekeeper, I had three more slides to show you in my first bit, which were pictures of the King Tide uh, around the bay. And there we get a... a the, the one we had in 2010, it was equivalent to the, the normal tide we would get in, in uh, every year in about 2030. So in about uh, a snapshot in time. And that's why people go out and take these photos, because it's good, as you say, it's a really good indication of where the areas that are going to get flooded are going to be. And those areas are where people are focusing a lot on. That, you know, if you have a problem now, if you, have a, if you go down the Sausalito on-ramp and it gets flooded on a regular occasion, that's going to be every tide. So these are areas that you can focus in already. They, so some of these things, uh, the, the effects of sea level rise are not going to be great surprises to us. Um, so they're just going to be, the existing areas are going to get more wet and they're going to get more wet more often. Uh, and your second point about using sediment and capturing sediment, that again is a really good idea. And at the moment we don't make nearly as good use of the, uh, the, 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 the sediment we have on the bay. We tend to dump it out into the ocean and better use of that would be good. And also, you can go on to the next question. My turn? <laughs> okay, I live in Larkspur and I live in a flood area. And in fact, I live right on the water and we have floods even without all this. And uh, I wanted to ask you, to what extent are you sharing your studies with the, with the council at Larkspur and Corte Madera? If they're part of it, if anyone is represented from, them, from that area here? Um, that's the first thing. And the second one, uh, second question is, um, who's gonna pay for this? To what, extent, to what extent is FEMA going to be part of the, the bill here and is paying for it, or is it all going to fall on local governments? <laughs> um, well, I think that the, first of all, Jeremy and I are working together um, on another project looking, and, and with, with Marin County Flood Control at Corte Madera Bay and trying to understand what the resilience of wetlands are there to um, try to find ways to protect them so that they can dampen flooding impacts in that area. So um, there is some work underway in that area now looking at flood issues. It may not address the specific concerns that you have. And with regard to funding and who's going to pay for it, um, we like to say that, you know, right now 
Um, everybody's in dire straits from a funding standpoint. Um, you know, we've just come out of an economic downturn that, that has really uh, shrunken a lot of wealth of, of a lot of people and, and, and kicked a lot of people out of jobs. But we are going to likely have to do a lot of this work, uh, at least part of it, here in the region. So that means that we're going to have to find the wherewithal among ourselves to to pay for some of this. That doesn't mean that we're not going to get help from the state and federal government. We will over time. But in the short run, um, you know, looking at FEMA and, and their response in Katrina and the expense that, you know, the Army Corps and FEMA have poured into um, bringing New Orleans up to, I think it's not quite a, you know, resilience to a level five hurricane um, at tremendous expense imagine that having to be done around the country. So I think that we are going to have to roll up our sleeves uh, to some extent and, and um, be willing to pay for some of this at home. Uh, I first would like to thank the panel and it's really wonderful to have a regional representative to have Paul as our local representative and then a scientist because he really gave us this amazing perspective of all the different issues that we are dealing with. Uh, one of the things that I find difficult, uh, we are here pretty much preaching to the choir because all of the people who are here are here because they are interested, they believe in the challenges that are forthcoming. Um, but I think one of the challenges that we will have to, will be facing is how to pay for all of this. Our communities will have to be involved and to buy into it. And one of the things that I find um, I, the, discussing the tides and the fact that we will in the future be dealing with these high tide issues on a regular basis, if we begin to reposition the issue of sea level rise as not just sea level rise that may happen in 50 years from now or you know, 75 years from now, but as an event that is equal to some of the storms that we have had in the past that are becoming closer and closer in the time frame. So what uh, advice do you have in regards to how to bring the community together and how to build this, how to present this to the community so that we really have uh, buying into the process and uh, greater community involvement and willingness in the future ob obviously to help pay for the, the work that needs to be done. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I finally got a chance to speak here. Um, well, public outreach in this county is actually very good. Um, the one thing that I could suggest is that information like this needs to be brought forward to your elected officials in each community and to, uh, you know, shake that cage at that level because they're the ones that make the change and listen and are able to take a look at this for prioritizing what they need to focus on and also to get uh, neighborhood and community groups to uh, to weigh in on this as well so that type of outreach to start with is important and then working its way up to the elected official level the elected official level is critical because the elected officials determine where their monies go in terms of capital improvements and funding and things of that nature when the local agency and the property owners are involved with having to pay part of the bill so that's what I would suggest, at least. I think this is for Paul. Um, it's a, a public-private question. Um, just in the short term, it seems to me that there are many um, homes developments that have been built in what is currently a bad place. At what point does private property become so eroded and unusable because of the water coming and going. Um, and I'm, as the woman from uh, Corte Madera made me think of this because I've canoed through that marsh area and, see, and seen how houses are really literally hanging over the water. At what point does the property become unusable and then is there a transfer from the pu private to the public when someone's house can no longer stand and there's no way of building it up? Do you see what I'm getting at? 
I do, I do see what it's you're getting at. It's just lost, and they write it off on their taxes, and it becomes this little mound. Now, Amy, of I don't know if I've got a clear answer for that, but I can give you some examples of where uh, something similar has occurred elsewhere. If you go to the city of Pacifica, there are homes that were built along the ocean, and over the years, the land, er the land eroded due to wave action from the ocean. And eventually, those homes had to be demolished, and those people had to relocate. Now, as far as who uh, suffered the loss, was, there, was, was the property owner you know, recuperated for that loss or not? I couldn't tell you. But I do know that, um, that this has occurred elsewhere where they've had to deal with it. And I, I, would, I would be willing to bet that in Pacifica, in that, in that case, what happened was people lost their homes and had to move on. And um, because they couldn't protect those areas anymore, but I, I don't think I can answer your question any better than that. So, I think I think Paul's right that, um, it, and it's not just Pacifica. If you remember Fremont, where the hill came down and mudslide uh, wiped out ten homes. Um, I mean, these things do occur in 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 the Bay Area um, with some with some frequency. And I think the the problem with sea level rise is that it's going to occur uh, affect many, many, many areas and many communities because we have built a lot of things on what were historically tidal marsh. So I, I think that we have to find a way to protect that wealth. And I, I don't think that we want to lose that value on such a large scale. I mean, if you look at what just happened in the uh, recent downturn in the economy with the d decrease in property values throughout the country, it was a big hit. To, uh, to the American economy. And I don't think that we want to see that happen again. So I think that, as, as Jeremy said, we don't want to be beating a hasty retreat um, in, in the face of sea level rise. So I think it's incumbent on us to come up with strategies that enable us to deal with that kind of situation in a more orderly fashion that protects community wealth. Uh, for Jeremy, what is the ideal levy height, uh, top of levy, uh, both for the San Rafael shoreline and for the art project is, I mean, magic elevation, elevation 10, 12? Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to give you the actual elevation, but I can tell you how they calculate it. That might be a way to do it. Um, they take the, 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 the water surface elevation, the still water surface elevation that we have at the moment at high water. Uh, I mean high, high water. And then you add on, you look at the, the historical record of how that elevation has changed over 50, 100 years or so. And that gives you an idea of the, of the extreme elevation you're going to get. And then you add on top of that, well, I'm going to have some waves as well. So you figure out how, how big the waves are going to be by the wind blowing in the, in the bay. And so that's going to add another couple of feet on top of that. Um, and you f then, then, you, then you look at the, the, the shape of the shoreline that you have and how the waves are going to come across that shoreline and how they're going to um, hit the levee and how high they're gonna, the water is going to run up the levee. And then you add a two feet on top of that, and that's your height. Has that been, <laughs> <laughs> has that been uh, quantified or figured out anywhere? Oh, is there absolutely, one? everywhere. Uh, when, that's how FEMA do it. And then, then the difference between what you, the FEMA would have done, say, five years ago and now is they add on an allowance of sea level rise. So do, do, you know, do you know one elevation anywhere? Uh, I one. do. Uh, da if you go around the whole of San, San Jose, 16 foot above um, uh, NAVD. Elevation 16 above N N okay. NAVD. Yeah. Now, it varies around the bay, so don't quite, you don't need the one here. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Jeremy, um, I, I really liked your uh, strategic realignment there. That uh, made a lot of sense, a little bit at a time. Um, but you know, all problems have two sides. And you all focused really well on the bay side, the ocean side. You didn't look at what happens to those big rivers that come flooding in here. And there's a the biological, you know, the fish and everything else that transfers back and forth. Yeah, I mean, that's not addressed by this process here, um, other than pumping it out and basically putting a, um, a bulkhead somewhere that stops that transfer of fish and Humphrey the whale and whatever wants to go up this. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, the, the, there are, we have uh, creeks and sloughs, which are an integral part of the, uh, the bay ecosystem, and as you rightly say, provide uh, migration uh, of fish, fish passage. Um, 
They are, uh, we do a lot of studies on how to incorporate um, the, the bird and the, and the fish species into the, into the wetland restoration. I mean, that's what the rest, a lot of the restorations were, were, were driven by in, in the first place. Um, the problem we have with, um, with sea level rise or climate change is that coincident flooding from the, from the, from the land side through the, on the fluvial flooding and the high bay elevations we will get, expect to see with a storm as well. So what happens is, and it happened in Martinez in 2006, and it happened um, in a lot of the air, uh, in, in, on Sonoma Creek in the same, in the same period, um, in, in New Year's, of course, because that was a public holiday. And they, the, the water comes down, and the bay is too high, so the water backs up in, in, along the, on the, along the um, along the creek. So then you have to build higher levees to, to protect the people who live on either side of that creek. Um, and then how you maintain that type of flood, flood risk management sort of conveyance channel and provide the ecological benefits is another form of retreat where you move the, the levees, you make them wider, so you provide a floodplain associated with that creek, which we, again, we've, we've tended to fill in and build upon with houses and so on. So just like around the bay, when we're talking about realignment and providing more space for the bay, uh, there's a concept called living rivers, which is epitomized in the, in the Napa River, where they've moved the, le the levees wider to provide just those natural ecosystem functions which you're, you're describing for the, for the fish and other species, but on the, on the rivers themselves. So they are an integral, those rivers and sloughs and creeks are an integral part of the bay. And so I was providing was, a, was like a cross section for part of the bay, but there's every part of the bay needs a different type of type of plan or strategy or vision um, to, for the long term. I'm not sure who I'm not sure who to address this question to. So anybody who has an idea, I'd go for it. Um, there was a slide, I think, from Jeremy, Jeremy early in his presentation. I was a little startled to see it, and so I may have misinterpreted what you were saying. But um, one, are all potential solutions being looked at? For example, everybody moves to Nevada on the other side of the Sierras, and we just give up? Or we drop a gate at the Golden Gate Bridge and just make a big old wall and uh, just refill the bay. So and just make all that great marshland move into the relatively shallow bay and, and say, well, there is a reason to maybe move the shoreline inwards. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, I realize that's probably a very unfashionable thought, but no, um, I'm, from Bo I, I, I'm from no, Boston, and that's my excuse. It's, so. it's, it, it is right. We should be exploring all the different alternatives that there are, um, and they have been, to a certain extent, I mean, putting a barrier at the bay has been looked at. It's been looked at in other estuaries. It has huge water quality and environmental issues related to it, and I think one thing that we need to consider just as with, uh, with a lot of our planning is what does society actually want out of the bay? Or what do we expect and how do we, how we, what are the values that we value? Now, in the last 30 years, we spent a lot of money and effort restoring large amounts of the bay in terms of the wetland restorations and, 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 and trying to put back a, an ecosystem uh, which had been... Um, uh, altered considerably in the, pre the previous century. And so that there's been a lot of work done on that, and, and there's been a lot of work uh, putting in protection from people like BCDC to stop people filling the bay for, 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 for these reasons. Um, I don't think, personally, I, don't, I, I think our adaptations should sort of incorporate those values. I don't think why we should throw those values out just because some of the environmental stresses are going to change. Um, we're not as badly off as the Netherlands in terms of they have to do, they're, they're constrained to do certain things because their whole country is underwater otherwise. Here we do have areas which are low-lying, but there are areas which are higher up. There are, we have different types of um, a shoreline that which we can, we can manage. So I, 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 we present, we, we show sort of one type of adaptation strategy here, which is 
does incorporate some fill uh, or some filling uh, bayward of the levee. But there are other opportunities to do realignments. There are other opportunities um, to use the natural marshes, which already exist. We have a lot of salt ponds in, in, in places, which uh, there's a large amount of planning being done now for the, with these types of ideas of building up the marshes, which will also help serve as, uh, to buffer the sea level rise. So I think there's lots of different strategies. The one I wouldn't particularly proposed, well, one, I wouldn't like to go to Nevada, so that's, I'll put that one out, because um, people already live in Nevada, so, you know, and, and I've met them, so it's, but the, the, the one I, the, the other one I would strongly oppose is putting a barrier over the, in the front of the, the bay, which is a very, it's a perennial issue, I mean, BCDC on their website have a whole, have a whole piece about why we shouldn't do that, it, it, it'll be the death of San Francisco Bay. It's been the death of a number of estuaries in Europe. Um, it's been seen as a quick way of doing something, and it's it's not the it's not a solution um, that will, is a balanced solution, um, and it's not a long term solution because if the sea level continues to rise, you've got to build a bigger barrier, and that's what people with barriers have to do. Yeah. As, <laughs> no, well, no. And, and I think that, you know, Jeremy's right. The, we did a study of the, um, the impacts of doing a barrier across San Francisco Bay. Every, everybody kind of defaults to that solution first. It's like, well, let's just keep the ocean out. Then we don't have to worry about it. But we, we have to give up so much, not just our, um, not just the wetland restorations that we have done over the last 30 plus years, but the Port of Oakland, the Port of Redwood City, the Port of Richmond, Port of Benicia, all and and all of the um, all of the refineries that we rely on for the gasoline that drive power our cars, all rely on the shipping that passes in and out of the Golden Gate. The crabs that we eat at Fisherman's Wharf and other places are nursed in the bay, and then they migrate out to the um, shoals offshore in the ocean, and if we build a barrier there, then we just kiss the crabs goodbye. Likewise, the salmon, um, now they're holding on for dear life, but um, we still have salmon runs in the bay, and we give those up if we, um, if we put a barrier in, because we simply, I, I no dam has been very successful at, at maintaining, you know, viable fish runs above it. Um, so there's a tr there's a number of tremendous costs. Just the ability to sail out of San Francisco Bay easily, like we do now, um, and and uh, there's so many, um, you know, reasons why you know keeping that that gate open to tidal flow is important. And I don't think that we have to immediately assume that we're going to have to abandon our neighborhoods either. I think that we can find ways to protect our neighborhoods and, um, and do the best we can. And we're going to have to help out those people in the Bay Area who lack the resources to respond. There are those of us who will find it difficult to muster the funds to um, do protection in our communities. But we have to remember that there are other folks who are not as well off as we are, and we're going to need to help them too. So that's going to have to be an important consideration of our adaptation strategies going forward is how do we um, help out the uh, folks in, say, the Canal District, where we may not have the resources to um, you know, pull off an adaptation strategy. And I just want to plug a document that uh, Joe hasn't mentioned, but that BCDC helped to put together. And it was published in May of 2010 by Spur. And it has, um, it's uh, adapting to climate change. And it has a number of very sane strategies for all different kinds of climate change adaptation, including sea level rise. There are a number of strategies that are specifically outlined there. It's just downloadable from the web. And it's... Um, it gives you an idea of the, the assortment of the things that we'll have to have in our toolbox, if you will, to respond to climate change, including rising sea levels. And it's very readable. It's kind of fun. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, and I'm going to answer the question. Yeah. 
Yes, this will be quick. Um, I just want to thank all four of you for educating all of us and being here present. This is your time, and I think everybody needs to think about volunteering, like you're just addressed people in the canal and that kind of thing. Us working together as a community is so important and giving our time. I just wanted to know if the Coastal, uh, California Coastal Commission is involved with you. Do you work in sync with them? Do you? Yes. Y you are, okay. That's all I had to say and thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess it's, uh, it's uh, my turn. Um, obviously, I guess, uh, it, I, I shouldn't say obviously, but from my point of view, it appears that we're, gonna, we're kind of in this alone. We have to find a way to solve these problems financially because everybody else around the country and around the world is facing similar situations. And uh, we may be able to count on the feds or state to deal with infrastructure issues, but at the end of the day, protection, uh, you know, mitigation of the shoreline and so forth is probably going to fall on us as individual landowners as, the FEM as FEMA determines that we're at flood risk. The, the problem is, is whenever we do things along the shoreline, we are spending a tremendous amount of our resources going through permitting processes. As an example, San Rafael Canal, approximately a third of the costs associated with dredging of the canal were associated with um, environmental clearances, testing, and so forth. Is there a strategy to find a way to re utilize resources more efficiently so that we don't have to spend so much money on testing, environmental review, et cetera, so we can use more of the money on actual bricks and mortar improvements? Well, I, I think there's a, a few answers to that. <clears throat> One is that we're developing a regional sediment management strategy to find uh, more efficient ways, working with flood control managers who are the ones who manage these channels. As, as in Jeremy's presentation, he talked about ways of using that uh, material nearby um, so that it's a, an asset and a resource to the community as opposed to something that's a waste product that has to be hauled off. Um, so I think that th that's, that's part of the answer. Um, and another part is that we, we do want to protect water quality, and one of the biggest um, sources of pollution in the Bay is sediment-borne pollution. So sediment um, chemically bonds very well with pollutants, and so that's the reason for the testing. Um, BCDC, along with the Regional Board, the Army Corps, the EPA, um, and other agencies who are responsible for issuing permits for dredging, have created the Dredge Material Management Office so that they meet in our office every two weeks to review proposals for dredging so that you're getting one answer out of the agencies at, all at one time instead of being ping-ponged back and forth between uh, different agencies with, the, you know, one saying this and one saying that. So they resolve the, the issues at the table together so that the applicant is getting a, a unified response from the responsible permitting agencies. Um, and that's been in place for um, 12 years, and it's been working pretty effectively, I, th I think. And so, but the gentleman who was talking about um, trying to deal with the stormwater flows into the bay and, and, and the pollutants getting there in the first place, I think is also part of our responsibility. And I think low impact development can help us with that and other strategies that can reduce the contaminants flowing into the bay so that we have more sediment that's, that's a, viable, a valuable resource than um, something that's a, effectively a pollutant. Could I add to that as, um, as well here? Um, I had a slide in my presentation about encouraging property owners to work with and partner with the agencies and or do some some level of contribution in terms of uh, involvement and um, I'm not suggesting that this might be uh, an appropriate approach but I have seen in the past where an area study is done by an agency that involve partnerships of the property owners and by doing that Collectively, it um, reduced 
because the area study looked at the bigger picture and addressed all the environmental review for the larger area. It allowed the property owners, as they developed their lands or as they dealt with whatever they were going to deal with, to uh, minimize their exposure to a subsequent permit process or review process because they were allowed to tier off of the greater project or the greater study. So that's where maybe the private property owners can get involved here with this effort with the multiple agencies is that type of partnership might in the long term minimize your exposure to a more um, individualized permit or review process that could be lengthy. Well, I want to thank everybody, and uh, maybe maybe these gentlemen will be willing to stick around for a few more minutes outside. That's up to them. They all look a little tired to me, but um, <laughs> I wanted to say I, I just kept thinking. There's an African proverb that says um, the best time to plant a tree is 40 years ago, and the second best time to plant one is today, and that's kind of where we are with climate change. I think you know, roughly 40 years ago. We knew this was happening, and we even knew what to do to mitigate it. And frankly, you know, as a global society, we didn't do it, and here we are. But the second, the second best time is today to actually deal with the results of it and to understand that we need to continue to mitigate so that the results aren't worse than what they already are. And one thing that we can do is we can, you know, as everyone here has said, get involved, talk to people, you know, Persuade them that it's real because a lot of people still don't really think this is something that's going to face them. But I think anyone who has children or nieces and nephews or grandchildren or cares about younger children, I mean, obviously, this is a concern. And locally, in addition to paying close attention to this man right here, Paul, who is um, on top of it um, for our local community, you can actually come to our next quarterly climate change action plan meeting, which is April 26th at 7 p.m., where, where we talk about this for our local community. And Sustainable San Rafael is actually getting together also a climate change adaptation working group. And tentatively, we're thinking of meeting May 17th. But if you go to our website, website, we will have a set date posted for that soon. So again, thank you all so much for caring, and thank you for coming, and thank you for all your questions, and thank you so much to the panel. <laughs>